Okay, uh, thank you for coming to everyone and welcome to the Monday Design Forum. Uh, just before we start, I will I would like to do a knowledge of country. So let's we go. I acknowledge that we are meeting and working on Aboriginal land, and I pay my respects to the Palawa people, the traditional owners of this land, its skies and waterways. I pay honor to elders past, present, and emerging. So um, today we are here to, to introduce and to present uh, Edu Paul. Edu Paul is a creative director. Well, he has more than 25 years of experience in the creative industry, mainly in advertisement across many different roles, but mostly as a creative director. And, and he's a fantastic professional that has been traveling all around the world and working in multiple places with very weird people and very interesting people as well. So without taking more time of his presentation, please just welcome uh, Edu Paul, that he will go ahead with his presentation. So welcome Edu. I can't hear you, you are mute, Edu. Done, it was a Done. test, you passed the test. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, it's it's uh, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks thanks for inviting me and thanks for doing this this project to turn Monday into an inspiring day instead of a a day that we all feel like a yeah we we hate. No, it's it's good to start the week on the right foot. Hopefully, today what I'm going to share with you is inspiring enough. It's uh it's a video. Oops, there's a bit of echo. No, I will be here taking care of muting everyone. No worries. Perfect. So, so it's, it's going to be a video um, heavy um, presentation because there's a lot of cases and stuff. And, and what I do with cases is that nothing gets lost and the accent doesn't get in the way. So everything is clear. Um, so yeah, let's let's go for it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share. Um, Jose, I have my phone with me in case the sound doesn't work or whatever. Uh, no worries, I will let you know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's see. Share screen. I, I've optimized everything, so it should be fine. Um, let me see. Can you see that full screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Well, that was the title of, the, of, my, of my talk. And uh, as most of you know, probably, I stole this title uh, from one of the most famous scenes of the worst of the three godfathers. Um, let, me, let me play a clip with Al Pacino to remind you, just in case. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. And, and I think that that's, that defines a bit my approach to advertising. I've been in advertising for, as, as Jose was saying, over 25 years but never so much attracted to the commercial side of things. I like the art, it, the intellectual challenge, the opportunity of working with very talented people and hope that something wraps off. In short, I've been somehow trying to escape advertising for 25 years as one of my mentors and good friends, Tony Segarra used to say to me, like you've, you've been trying so hard to escape that you've ended in Tasmania. Um, both him and I are from Barcelona. But he is somebody much more, he knows what he's doing. He defines himself as a man who writes ads. And if that's the criteria, um, although we are in the same business, we're not in the same business because, uh, don't get me wrong, I've, I've done TV ads, a lot of them, but my career hasn't been defined by them, quite the opposite. And, and that's what I'm gonna try and share with you today. And, and that's where I'm showing how advertising goes and reaches you wherever you are, uh, at least in my, in my case, right? So I'm gonna share with you uh, my career in 10 non-ads, uh, which is, um, I guess there was a, uh, the moment where I, um, I finished my degree was the, the moon where internet was incipient, was, was boom, blooming. Uh, so my first job in advertising was in an interactive or a digital agency. That probably sets the pace of what I've done since then, right? It's, uh, 
it's a different way of looking at things and telling us telling a, a 20 second 30 second story that has to work on video and that has to get your attention while you're you're watching a, a game or uh, the final of a uh, merit at first sight um i think that that helps take a different approach and this different approach is uh is very clear in the first project that i'm going to talk to you about today so come with me to 2003 to see a conspiracy theory that's the first thing that i that that they did that had uh, international repercussion. Um, let me give you a bit of context. Uh, I don't know if, if it's familiar, but in Madrid has a, a, a statue of a, of a bear and a tree that defines, it's, it's like the, the essence of the city. Uh, it's in the center of Madrid. And uh, working on a project for Nike, we created this stupid, um, uh, story that was based on the, the fact that that bear escaped, that uh, a lightning fell on the, on the statue and the, the bear came alive. And, uh, and it was running out of the streets. And uh, if you see the bear, you had to run. Um, this story um, was a promotion for the race. The race that's called San Silvestre Valle Canada, that's, that's uh, very popular and that happens the last day of the year in Madrid. Uh, so at the end, we revealed that it wasn't a bear, it was 12,500 bears chasing you. Um, that, as I said, I'm very proud of this campaign. I'm proud almost like on behalf of a whole country because. It was the second time that Spain got a Grand Prix in, in the prestigious uh, Cannes Film Festival or Cannes Advertising Festival. And I would love to share with you, but nothing ages worse than cutting edge, edge technology. So it's impossible to access this project anymore. It's in flash. So, well, let me stop it. The rest of the of the stories have a video, so uh, so you can see what it was. Uh, starting with this one, the second project. So the first one was a conspiracy theory. The second one, a portable picnic, and that's that's for Coca Cola. And um, way before uh, the famous campaign that started in Australia of share a Coke, uh, just took the, the world by a storm. Um, Coca-Cola was always been, uh, has always been a, a product that is meant to be shared. So what we've created and we, we shared with uh, influencers and, and the media was a picnic that allowed you to have a, a day in the grass, um, even if you were uh, at the office, so we shared that with everyone, and it was it it contained um, astroturf and two bottles, so you could share it with somebody. So it was enough room for four feet, um, and that's that's where we were talking about how how it, that's how it uh, the content that that came in that in that package, and this uh, was distributed at the same time as a video that we released that documented an event that we, we did in, in Lithuania. Let me, sh let me play it for you.
So I, I guess this exemplifies a bit what I was saying at the beginning. I wasn't that concerned about how many more bottles of uh, Coke were sold, but more to create an event, create something that felt a bit whimsical, a bit playful. Um, I have to say for this campaign, something that was, was funny is uh, we spent a lot of time doing something that we ended up not using. The, we started developing um, a vending machine that would recognize when you were barefoot to deliver uh, a bottle of Coke, and it wasn't easy. And at some point, somebody said, hold on a second. What if we have a remote and we have somebody that is not visible? So we identify there's somebody barefoot and you just press a button and release a Coke. So that's that's what we ended up doing, a bit of uh, advertising magic. But all the magic has tricks, right? Anyway, the next, the next uh, story is again a non ad. It's a pizza tracker. And back in the day, in uh, in um, I was in, living in in my in Boulder, Colorado, and we had Domino's Domino's Pizza as a as a client. And at that point, it seemed they came to us um, to do advertising. Right, we were pitching for the advertising, and uh, I decided to with a friend. Uh, to redefine the way that you would order and track a pizza. So while they're looking for spots, I gave them something completely different. What happened is we ended up losing that pitch to another big agency and they did the advertising, but we won the innovation side of the business, which wasn't really being pitched. So uh, I'm very proud of that because not only we achieved something that was meaningful for the brand but it redefined really somehow the the way that we order online right now was the first time that we applied um principles of logistics of fedex for instance to pizza it wasn't so much about the food it was about the the user experience and the premise was well let me let me play for you the masters of delivery changed the game again with another innovation our goal was to put delivery innovation back into the Domino's playbook. With the BFD Builder, consumers could visually build their perfect pizza to their liking, making even non-cooks feel like pizza makers. Then send it to Domino's, and 30 minutes later, the exact pizza was at their doorstop. Visitors could also register the pizza for others to order. The person who registered the pizza with the most orders got 500 bucks. Once someone placed a pizza order, the site launched the Pizza Tracker, giving customers the ability to track the status of their order, step by step in real time, all the way down to who at Domino's was putting their pizza in the oven or who was delivering your pizza. At long last, an end to the torturous emotional roller coaster of wonderings of where your food is at and when is it going to get to you. The Domino's Pizza Tracker and BFD Builder have been a massive success. Aside from countless blog discussions and media coverage like CNN, these two innovations have led to record online sales for Domino's. So what, what I really like about this is that we, uh, obviously I talk about our side of things, but, um, but it's important to acknowledge the fact that for this, something like this to happen, you have to have a very bold client that is partnering with you because that meant that they had to change their business. So that was a, a different way for them to um, operate. And that's, that's, what, um, that's what we did with Domino's. And, and this, this idea of the tracker is something that is available right here, right now as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting how, how you, you can really find businesses from advertising. Another another business. There's this sound. I don't know if somebody is is. Um, please, can you put a mute? There's there's a bit of uh, noise in the background. Please, thank you. Um, the fourth non-ad that I want to talk to you about, and it's very obvious when you see the title that is not an ad, is chocolate, and and that's what we did to launch um, a video game. It was FIFA 15 from Electronic Arts. And what we wanted to show with this is that um, it was so immersive. We wanted to recreate the feelings of, uh, of real football that you would get 
from the from the game and we started creating artifacts and uh, we had lots of different stories and this is the only one that we we made for real let me show you the launch and then we'll discuss the product itself So we did, we did the chocolate for real. First of all, I was recording this with Messi. I'm a Barcelona fan, and it's the first time that I was completely star starstruck. I couldn't really articulate anything. I was face to face with my with my idol, but that's the personal side of things. On the professional side of things, what we did is just capture this idea of, okay, we're gonna give you the whole experience down to the tears of happiness and uh, bitterness of a, uh, of uh, the best footballer in history, uh, in the in the packaging of the of the chocolate, it said what it, what's in this package has been through a lot. Emotionally, it's been shouted at, kicked around, booed at, cheered on, whistled, celebrated, fouled, patted on the back, red carded, awarded a trophy, embossed and packaged, and it may contain traces of li Lionel Messi's tears of victory and defeat. And then we had to, obviously, for legal reasons, have an asterisk saying does not really contain messy tears. But this was meant to be shared in a in a one of the biggest um, gaming conventions in uh, in Cologne uh, to complement the launch of of the game. Uh, so yeah, chocolate to sell video games. Um, another one that is a bit bizarre is we created a fitting room. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the show uh, Altered Carbon. It talks about the future where um, wealthy people don't die. Just when they feel like their their bodies age, they get a new body and they transfer their conscience. So in a way, um, the wealthier you are, the more you can choose and uh, to make sure that um, you don't have um, discrepancies between your conscience and your body. Anyway, very interesting, very out there. And we did a documentary about the future of uh, humanity with Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, Steve Aoki and lots of people and very, very fun project. But one of the things that we did as well is uh, use technology to allow you to check different skins before you hit purchase. So that's that's the the story we we created 
artificial people that were your reflection so you could feel how how comfortable you were with a different sleeve that's the term that they use in the show um to talk about bodies or skins and and uh, as you see uh, as you've seen we created we helped create a stance that were almost not branded by netflix but by the fictional company of the show where you can get your sleeve um it had to use um that's one of the things about technology as i said before that it ages quickly it also has a lot of um considerations technical considerations and in this case everything had to be done with uh, off the shelf um hardware and software because it, it was happening around the world from philippines to uh, poland um and sao paulo um anyway uh, that's that's a fitting room the weirdest fitting room i've ever seen followed by a, a flight in vr uh we did for eddie hat a uh, movie with uh, Nicole Kidman. It was the first time that an award-winning actor actor was um, was in a in a 360 film. In this case, very interesting the the way that we we recreated a whole flight, and there was a bit of a plot where she was. Um, it was a bit of a heist, um, or followed uh, combined with misunderstandings, uh, and it all happened in a trip from from New York to uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, the technical side of things is, is the most interesting one. Um, and and it, it made sense because we wanted people to have the feeling of being in a new plane. So the best way to feel immersed in that story is in a, in a true 360 degree stereoscopic, stereoscopic uh, cinematic quality sticks KVR with robotic motion control camera rigs, stitch CGI graphics and binaural, binaural audio. Uh, in case you wonder, I'm reading this. Yeah, there's, there was a lot of things to, to digest and the technical side of things is the most important thing. For instance, there was no ceiling. All the ceiling is CGI and, and there's, there's so many things here that the sky is completely fake. Um, but yeah, we, we need a lot of, um, a lot of work. This was a state of the art VR project at the time. Hmm. Run me through this one more time. No, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to go to the next one. The next one is a sound that's definitely not um, not an ad. Uh, this one is very special, very important for me. It's uh, it it talks about how my life was touched by a personal decision, which was the decision of moving to Tasmania that allowed me to work with anyone in the world that I wanted to work with. And in this case, it was a team of crazy people that I love from Uruguay. And uh, we had a groundbreaking idea that fit, that came in a, in a, in a very small box. Let me show you. Video. Is it possible that the sound of vehicles could contribute to the environment? We found our answer in global research that suggests that sound has an impact on plants and animals. Researchers from Oxford to other prestigious universities agreed that there is a frequency range that's favorable to the environment. If we managed to achieve certain harmony within these parameters, we could reach our objective. Create the first vehicle sound that's beneficial to the environment. Buscamos que el sonido tenga el menor ancho de banda posible en términos de frecuencia, así el sonido oculta o enmascara menos y así que ciertas especies puedan comunicarse más eficazmente. We now needed to take high to every vehicle, and we managed to do so by creating an intelligent processor that handles the sound composition dynamically according to speed. Cuando el automóvil se encuentra en movimiento, se agrega una nueva capa rítmica a medida que aumenta la velocidad del automóvil. 
no es simplemente pensar el, el sonido de un auto eléctrico, un auto híbrido, es pensar el sonido de un automóvil que, a diferencia de una tradición de, de vehículos que fueron dañando la naturaleza, estos lentamente ahora empiezan a beneficiarla. Nuestro trabajo tiene que hacernos sentir orgullosos de lo que le dejamos a las próximas generaciones. Hoy es a través de este pequeño aporte, pero bueno, de esta forma y entre todos es que vamos cambiando el mundo. And what has started as a test in in Uruguay now has expanded through Latin America and um, and yeah, just a Amongst other things, one of the things that I'm very proud of this project is that it's part of the, the permanent collection of uh, MoMA. It's not MONA, but uh, it's not bad. It, so, so yeah, it, it's, uh, it's been fascinating. And, uh, and yeah, it's a very humble project. Started with, uh, with a very humble intention. And like, okay, we don't know if this, this study is, we're going to make an impact or not, but it's a little change in the right direction. And, And yeah, that's that's what we thought it was. It was interesting, changing the sound of electric cars, followed by another project that has to do with cars. And this one is closer to us. And it's a four hour long uh, film following the, the trend of slow TV. I don't know if you've ever seen, I think that there's, it's on SBS. There's a, there's a film that I think it's, I don't know if it's eight hour long about the train. Well, we, we were halfway, but that's the limit that we had uh, for YouTube, uh, for Facebook. That's, it launched in Facebook and YouTube at the same time. And it was, uh, somehow it was imp impossible to avoid COVID, right, in, in this speech. This is a project that I did in my old company, We Are Social. And um, yeah, it's the, it's the first time that I direct uh, a project via WhatsApp and Google Meets because I couldn't be in location. Let me show you the case study as well. Il provvedimento prevede anche un'autocertificazione veritiera per tutti i più cittadini. As I said before, um, projects like this can only happen if you have a client that believes or that is pushing beyond the, you know, the expected. In this case, literally, uh, the, our client is the driver. 
he he drove this car. It, it was a two day shoot, um, and he had two more people in the car. Uh, we put a lot of um, GoPros um, and some um, better quality cameras from within the car. And uh, we took advantage of, of um, the limitations of production during, during the first wave of COVID. And uh, the music was done by a musician in Marseille that I would have never worked with otherwise. But anything, everything came together remotely and uh, it ended up being something that, not, that went beyond Australia. The impact was, was global as, as you saw in some of the, the, the quotes that we put in this, in this case study. Um, yeah, very, very unusual project for a, for, a, um, for a social agency like we are social. The one I'm going to share now is not that unusual. It's a TikTok challenge, right? It's just to me that the, the thing about TikTok challenges or anything that has to do with user generated content, it, it, um, it reminds me to a quote of Charlie Brooker, the, the creator of um, Black Mirror that said uh, in, an, in an article in The Guardian that TV advertising used to work like this. You sat on your sofa while creatives were paid to throw a bucket of shit in your face. Today, you've, you're expected to sit on the bucket, fill it with your own shit and tip it over your head while filming yourself on your mobile. Then you upload the video to the creatives. You do the work, they still get paid. It's not so much like that, but yes, this, this notion of uh, what he calls loser generated content has moved quite a lot since since that time but still you feel like why uh people are going to participate well basically because they find it fun it's fine expressive and in this case it's just a, a a divertimento um to launch the new video capabilities of a phone that they didn't have because it wasn't available we recreated one of the features of the phone and the results were quite surprising how do you create the most successful branded challenge in TikTok history? You don't, they do. There was nobody better to show the creative power of the Samsung Galaxy S21 than the people who do the most creating on their phones. Introducing the Video Snap Challenge, a unique TikTok filter that dramatized Samsung's 8K Video Snap feature which lets you pull high res stills from video. Over 100 influencers got involved and then things got crazy. It took off with TikTokers big time. The community created over 7 million videos. That's over 7 million how-to videos from Samsung's 8K video snap feature, disguised as a TikTok challenge. The video snap challenge has reached over 32 billion views. That's more views than the internet's five biggest videos combined. Showing a new generation the creative power of Samsung phones. I don't really care, I'm a big, big the Video Snap Challenge. The most successful branded challenge in TikTok history. And the view count keeps climbing. This is the first time in my life that I do anything that has billions. Billions with a B. I, we were completely overwhelmed. Well, I can I could tell you all the things that we did right, but it's always uh, 2020 hindsight, right? I don't know what has the expression, but you know what I mean. It, if it was easy to pinpoint at the success, you could have that that success all the time. It was mind blowing. And after that, I uh, um, well, shortly after, I decided to leave. We are social. Um, I love him, and, and it's been it's been really really exciting working there. But I I can't I can't be bothered about the commute. I wanted to to stay home, stay in Tassie, and and work remotely. So what now? Now I I'm like the world. It seems like um, I've been fascinated or trapped by these guys, um, NFTs, and uh, the metaverse, and all this virtual world that is is changing things rapidly and dramatically. Um, this board ape, um, if, you, if you are familiar with what has happened recently, that's as recent as two weeks ago, Yuga Labs, the, the, the creators of board apes, uh, 
raised four hundred million dollars, and uh, and we're um, how you call that? We're valued as a company at four billion again with a B dollars. A company that started with JPEGs. I I don't know what to make out of this. The, the, what I know is that I want to be inside. I want to be part of it. I understand what's going on beyond the money thing. <clears throat> and that's why I joined a company that's completely remote called Meta Campus. It's a global collective of uh, technology-minded experts with a focus on social innovation. And our aim is to empower people to succeed in the virtual economy. There's more and more virtual jobs happening. And unfortunately, the training is not there yet. So understanding how you can equip young people or all people, right? Because there's one thing about the metaverse that doesn't really uh, judge you based on your gender or your sexual orientation, let's put it this way, or age or anything. You have the opportunity of, of um, having a fresh start. Ageism doesn't exist. All that should be obsolete. So that's why we wanted to create this platform to train anyone, but, uh, but we already have been identifying ways of doing it for people that don't have access to, to um, education in, in, in a similar way of, as others. Um, yeah, we wanted to make it the virtual world more accessible and inclusive, and we are already working on our first project that is meant to launch in November. By the way, if anyone is willing to give me one of these, it's only $59 million at JPEG. No? Just in case somebody has second thoughts, here is my virtual wallet. Pay, feel free to deposit that amount of Ethereum and I'll, I'll do the rest. Anyway, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well done. Uh, uh, I will. I will have a thought about this. And uh, maybe. Uh, uh, thank you. We are lucky that we can record this, so we can take note of your wallet, and then we can send you the the amount. Please feel free. Uh, absolutely. Okay. So the, thank you. Thank you Edu, so much for sharing this um, non-spot uh, advertisement approach. I mean, non-spot practice of advertisement as well as well. I don't know if it's the right way to call it advertisement because when I met you, I mean, as you know, I've been working in advertisement as well uh, for many years, but my understanding changed when I met you and, and you always give me this, uh, this vision of how advertisement could change things. And in these projects, you can, uh, things like, for example, the sound of the, the, um, the 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 design of the sound of the car the electric cars how this could affect and benefit as well or well i don't know all the examples that you have shared so thank you so much for for this and i will i will love to to give you the opportunity for the audience uh, through the chat or feel free to turn on your cameras and your mics and make some questions to edu if you want there is anyone that has any any questions or were to comment anything related with the presentation? Cool. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. Apologies, I came in a little bit late, so I missed a little bit. I was teaching, but um, I it was really um, vibrant and of course engaging and, and visually stimulating presentation. So thank you so much. Um, could you share a little bit more about MetaCampus that you mentioned at the end? Oh, MetaCampus is is a yeah. We started uh, in January. We just went public. We just been like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, we started with with a very loose idea of. Uh, um, we wanted to be a company that operates in the metaverse and to see the opportunities that we have to bring people on board. Um, and we did that with this loose intention and with a great team. Uh, uh, that's 
it's a it's a complete I don't know if we're 15 people, but these 15 people are from Toronto, Dubai, Kent, Gothenburg, Barcelona, and yeah, Tasmania. So uh, what what we are doing, and and what's interesting is is the fact that we have people that are really good at tokenomics, so understand the the new economy, and and, and we have a, a very robust um, program that uh, that is, is going to allow us to to create and to um, give part of the ownership to the of, of the company to the public. First, it's going to be a centralized company, but the idea is eventually to be a DAO, at least an investment DAO that allows, that funds interesting projects, but also funds students that can afford the fees. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, it's centralized, but it's also a DAO at the same time. It's, it's centralized, mm -hmm. it's centralized, but it's, it's going to have an investment DAO, an right. investment DAO that is going to have um, uh, investors, partners, uh, and, and a council, so we will have, uh, we will distribute things amongst uh, or shares or participations of, of how you call it, governance of the, of the DAO to mm. people, but also to the alum, alumni. So they are mm -hmm. going to be part of the of the, the project. This is this this the idea is to have enough for for people to fund a lot of startups and to make sure that mm -hmm. that this is this is uh, as um, as sustainable and as uh, fair as possible. That's why we have um, the person that we have in Kent is Alison Alexander, who's head of ethics. And that is mm -hmm. very important for us. She is, she is part of a, um, an organization of women in the metaverse and is very connected in that area as well. So that's, that's something that we, we, we do wanna have create something that feels good, as you know, there's something that has been in the headlines of, of media. I think, I, with all the respect, media doesn't know much about metaverse. That doesn't stop them from writing about it. And they don't know much about NFTs. But the headline of NFTs are very polluting is, is, is very mainstream, right? And it's true. There's, there's, there's something that there's a lot of computer power behind all this. Um, but I would say that this is quickly being fixed. The mm -hmm. idea is not to stop. It is to improve, right? Mm -hmm. The pollution didn't stop the industrial revolution. We just got better at it. I think that this is, this is they call it about the fourth um, uh, industrial revolution. And, and that's that's something that is, is important that we understand from within. And that's, that's something that we, we really keep in mind. Anyway, long story short, it's a company in the making. We are at the moment, working on our first project and uh, working very closely with an artist called Jose Garcia Cesar, who's helping <laughs> out. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's great to feel like we are all together and we have, it's, it's very naive or very, very romantic, but we want to do something that is meaningful. Uh, and that's, that's what we are trying to do. So we're still figuring it out, but it's, it's very exciting at the moment. Sounds exciting. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa, by the way, is one of our lecturers in the design program. Okay. And she's very talented. And she might do, she should do a, a talk because she has a very interesting background as well. Very, okay. very interesting. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, uh, anyone else? Some, uh, any more questions for Edu? If there's no questions, I can I can talk. <laughs> uh, there, there's something that you mentioned before we started with the Q and A that was yeah. the the power of advertising to do good or to change the world. Mm. Even if sometimes clients don't realize that there's there's something there that is very powerful. And there's an article from uh, Malcolm Gladwell that talks about how back he talks about how capitalism allows people to vote not every four years, but every, by, every time you buy something. Hmm. So right now with companies that are much more exposed, not just to their products, but about their behavior, 
uh, every time you go to the supermarket, every time you go to Coles, you decide who you support. And that's very, very exciting. He, he was talking in, in this article, which I, I can share with you, and then you can share it with, uh, with your students if you want. Um, mm. uh, he was talking about how in the 50s, most women didn't dye their hair. It was something that was, in the early 50s, uh, it was limited, or it was more reserved to, he says, don't quote me on that, that's his words, actresses and prostitutes. And, uh, and he said that all of a sudden L'Oreal launched because you're worth it, which was a message of female empowerment and encapsulated in a product that allow you to feel pretty. And uh, what's, what's interesting about that, whether we judge it or not, I, uh, what, what the reality is, and is that in the 50s, when that campaign came to life, the number of divorces in the States skyrocketed. And that tells you how there's maybe there's, there's something that was happening in society anyway, but the the fact that women felt more empowered and more in control, um, it's it's also reflected in the way that they consume, and and that to me is is a is a very interesting approach, almost like sociologically, and how to see the products are, are, are playing a more important role than the function that they have. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's curious how like advertisement has a lot of bad press, you know, like they, this, this not always so because it's always linked with capitalism or selling purpose and all, on all related with money. Well, but if you have a thought, everything at the end is related with money in our society, somehow. Yeah, I would say I would say though that the bad reputation is deserved. Huh? Uh, yeah, advertising is trying to sell you things and and stops you from what you're doing, and and it gets everywhere. Mm. And yeah, it's most of advertising, but most of everything, <clears throat> I would mm. say that ninety five percent of anything, any any area, is crap. There's that five percent that makes your job worthwhile, right? It's, mm. it, you can do the same about literature, or architecture, or any any um, discipline. Mm. There's a lot of things that you know. Just start looking at looking around, uh, but there's there's a there's the tip of the iceberg, the tip of the of the pyramid that makes it worth it and makes it interesting and, mm. and makes it worth having a conversation like this, otherwise just running ads here would be very, very boring. And, and what about the, the because you have been saying a few times um, during <clears throat> all the presentation about the amazing teams that you have been working with. So the, the, the variety of the diverse uh, backgrounds and talents that you have been working with, uh, because you have been working in most of the continents. Um, what about that? Well, it's it's true that there's there's a lot of people that have an affinity for the arts, right? And people that have a special talent and, and they they use it in that discipline. I've been lucky that I've always been in, in highly creative jobs, right? I, I met my wife. The Nelson Rafferty, which I don't, she, she's still here. I can see, I can see. <laughs> um, I met her in in uh, Wyden in Amsterdam, and one thing that I I remember one of my bosses in Amsterdam was telling us um, that advertising usually uh, expects you to fit a role. You have to speak. You have to write like a, like a brand. You have to design like a brand. And what happens when you try to mimic? A voice of a company is that it gets completely soulless and he was saying the opposite we embrace your voice we want a person a human voice whether your voice is literally a voice or it's art or it's photography or whatever craft you have and um, we were surrounded by artists and the important thing is that do the casting right don't guide them too much give them enough room so they can feel like they own it and the work the work and the brands behind the work start feeling 
uh, lightly and they, they start pulsating right and i think that that's that's what's interesting when when you um you're not trying to constrain um creativity to fit what's decided by a, a focus group but the other way around mm -hmm. you know i think that that's that's been it's been my story and obviously because i've been i've been so close to technology it on top of the artists you have the crazy engineers that see things from the other perspective they see the guts of things and how things work and that is very fun when you find the the the, the um, you know the, the place where those two perspectives converge hmm. where you have something that looks amazing but at the same time it has a way to operate that is innovative i think that that's there's one like ah that's, that's, it feels it feels important right and at the end of the day everything goes really fast and especially advertising and you want to transcend you want to create something that that is meaningful beyond um beyond the project right beyond beyond the camera beyond a brief that is just like different three months waves now you want to do something that has more life and how is becoming this transition of um working with well you're still working with big groups with th big teams but now is uh, remotely so this change from working in face to face with the hundreds of people and suddenly just working the same but through through the um, through the streams how how is going on with that uh, well, it's as I said um, when I was telling Vanessa that we we've been we are figuring out what we're doing right that's, that's it's not just the fact that we are remote the company is still just testing the waters and figuring out where, where we're going so there's a lot of uh, experimentation there's a lot of um, trial error and what's what's good is compared to other places where I worked that there was you know a, a lot of uh, tension here we are pushing together and I think that that's that's what I think is more exciting about this this project we most of us quit our jobs to start something that we don't know what it is so so it's and and we are not um spring chicken right we we are like this this i was talking about dying hair these gray hairs are natural gray hairs so i've been around for quite some time and we decided to do it and and that's that's the thing that's interesting when you have uh, more than a vision you have an intention you have an ambition that is shared i mean time difference is a bit of a pain but anything else you can work around. Yeah, it's a constant changing and adaptation. Mm. So uh, anyone else that wants to ask anything else? Any more questions? If not, we can keep talking. <laughs> uh, anyone else? No? OK. Well, Edu, thank you very much for this uh, beautiful uh, presentation and discussion. And, and it was very, very interesting. And just looking forward to keep working with you <laughs> and hearing more things. Ah, look, even in Catalan, they are saying thank you in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to stop the recording.